All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. I hope you uh, had a good time uh, getting to know uh, your new family of friends in the breakout room. I'm particularly grateful to those who I met in my breakout room, Tracy, Kaylin, Ethel, Colby, Ahmed, and Nicole. So great to know you, and I hope to see you and all of you at our fall leadership conference or at a future event. Um, so I found that this uh, topic of the art and science of play was so engaging, and um, and I, I hope that this particular exercise uh, will enable you to think further about the concept of play. And uh, just like this checklist that we provided for you, the prep uh, for boot camp is just another tool to help your chapter or you uh, with a future research project. So before I introduce our, uh, our uh, special guest speakers from the Beta Zeta New Chapter, uh, I wanted to have, uh, if you don't mind, Susan, um, there's a little bit of a moment here, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that we, we have a question for you from our breakout room. So uh, Susan, if you're available, uh, Colby, what was your question that, uh, see if we can get to, to the answer that you hope to receive. So my question was regarding going in more depth about the thing you said was the overarching questions and I was wondering where I could find that is that one for me yeah that one was for you okay thanks okay overarching question if you go to the honors program guide and the themes start on page 10 and and go through page 23 on page 10 for theme one, you'll see the, the theme is listed. It's the essence of play. And then right beneath that in bold print is the overarching question. So what are the natural philosophical foundations of play? And the overarching questions are be below each of the themes as the introductions are done. Perfect. You make it easy for us. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate it your time here. So we're going to go ahead and uh, I'm so excited to introduce uh, our uh, chapter presenters today. Uh, they come from the Beta Zeta New Chapter from Kenyatta College. And um, it's such a great segue because when I was a student officer, I really, really admire and I still admire this chapter of everything from great students to uh, really wonderful and generous advisors, you know, generous in giving tips on how to become a successful individual, a successful chapter. And this officer team is, is no different. Um, they are a group of unique individuals who have a really engaging um, honors in action project to talk about. So one of the things that was asked of me to give in the presentation was that very, they're very much in the same boat as you are um, from last year, where brand new members, they knew about Phi Theta Kappa, which is why they became a member, but they had very little of an idea of what an honors and action project are. But the project that they selected was so timely and, and in a way really personal for me because I actually visited Butte College a couple of weeks ago. And during my time there after the induction ceremony, I spent the next day um, at Paradise which is where there was this terrible, terrible campfire, which is what's called, um, really devastated uh, that town and so many communities around that area. And so the project that Beta Zeta New Chapter is going that they will present today is of, you know, so engaging and interesting and I can't wait to hear more about it. But before I introduce, hand the mic off to them. Um, they have accomplished so many great things this year. Everything from a regional level to a chapter level to international levels. Um, they were participating in the regional projects, which is something that our Nevada, California region offers. And so they received regional awards and community project, Founders Day project, environmental outreach, career and professional readiness and chapters united. Um, but they also won amazing Hallmark Awards at the regional level, second place officer team 
first place distinguished chapter, first place honors and action team two, and first place for honors and action project. And in an international level, they are um, they receive they are a top 100 chapter, and they received awards for the distinguished honors and action as well as distinguished chapter. So it is a privilege to introduce a chapter I've admired for so many years, the Beta Zeta New Chapter at Kenyatta College. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. Okay, let me share my screen. Can everybody see my screen before we start? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do I have the other members of my team here? I see Anthony, Annie, and Bella. Can you hear me and see me? Yes. yes. Yep. Okay, perfect. All right, Anthony, whenever you are ready to start, let's go. Hi, guys. My name is Anthony Leon Chibitasi, and I'm co president of Beta Center News. But I'm also one of your uh, regional officers for Nevada and California as Northwest VP. Hi, everyone. My name is Annie Moreira, and I'm the vice president of scholarship for Beta Center News. Hi, everyone. My name is Giovanna Mancinelli, and I'm the Vice President of Public Relations for Beta Zeta Nu. Hi, everyone. My name is Bella Zhang, and I'm the other co-president for Beta Zeta Nu. So we are glad to be here to present our previous HIA project to you. Um, next slide, please. Um, so project selection. So first, to read through the whole HIA guide, um, we have each officer pick a theme that they were most interested in. After they read through it, they presented a summary of the theme and shared their brainstorm ideas about the possible topics that we could explore related to the theme. After that, the team voted on the two themes that they were most interested in doing further research. And then the officer team split into two teams to investigate the topics that they have chosen. And then after that, after doing a deeper research and learning more about the two topics, the officer team voted to decide on theme two, natural and constructed environments. Um, next slide, please. So, and we did face some problems during that time. So first, it was really difficult to choose between the final two topics because they were both great topics and related to the needs of our local community was having at that time. And then the competition between the two groups created a sense of stress, but we solved the problem by letting go of our feelings and going with the, tr the truly better option. And then lastly, we have lost a large amount of time in selecting the final topic because we spent much more time to investigate the two possible topics than we expected. And by the fourth semester started, we hadn't had pick a theme yet. So we were behind the schedule because of that. So I know that earlier in the presentation from Susan, she specifically said, do not vote on a theme. Do not pick between the seven themes and try to vote for them as a chapter. And that's exactly what we did. And now you can see uh, just firsthand example of why that's not a very good idea. But eventually we were able to uh, put aside our differences and to choose the theme that would make a better project and that we would be able to learn more from. And after we kind of came to that consensus, like this is going to work for all of us, that was when we were able to all come back together and work on this, this project as a whole. And our chosen topic was California is ablaze, what is there to do? So why did we choose this topic? We wanted to study the prevention of California wildfires because wildfire frequency has been increasing. And we know that there are many, many methods of prevention, but yet the wildfires continue. So if we know how to get rid of the fires and we know how to stop them from happening in the first place, how come they're still happening and how come they're still devastating our state? So we wanted to know the pros and the cons of the preventative methods. And how did we do our research? We actually started by interviewing three professors from Kenyatta College. We interviewed an environmental science, anthropology, and firefighting professor, and they explained to us the frequency of wildfires, the causes for wildfires, the Native American approach to wildfires, and also the methods of firefighting that are used and the barriers that firefighters face when they are dealing with the wildfires. From there, we developed a very broad research question. This was really a rough draft, something that we could refer back to when we were talking and uh, reading the scholarly articles for our research. 
And after that, we had to find out, okay, how are we going to find these scholarly articles? So we spoke with our school's research librarian, and she actually put together a whole website for us full of sources and places where we could find our scholarly articles. So she told us basically where to look. And from there, we chose general topics to research, basically from our general research questions, stuff like fire frequency, uh, Native American approach, fire prevention. And from there, we assigned an active member to each one so that we would have a variety of articles for each topic. And each member was supposed to read one article, summarize it, and present it to the chapter. And many of us ended up doing more, but we all started with one each. And after we had finished reading all of the scholarly articles, we considered narrowing down our research question to be more focused, but because of a lack of research for each specific topic, we ended up going with our broad one, which is, are controlled fires and forest thinning more harmful or helpful when used to reduce California wildfires? So I talked about those two methods, controlled fires and forest thinning. Those are the main methods of fire prevention and those are the ones that we focused on with our project. So controlled fires are low temperature burns in small areas across the landscape. You can think of it kind of like a checkerboard with the black areas on the checkerboard have the plants as usual, but the white areas have been burned to the ground. So there are no plants there. And this is the method used by many Native American tribes throughout history. Now they didn't have satellites, so it's not exactly a checkerboard pattern, but what they would do is that when they were leaving a certain area to move somewhere else, they would set it on fire as they were leaving. And it created a patchwork section, patchwork sections of plants and no plants. Forest thinning is the removal of certain plants to lower the density of plant matter. It's very, very similar. It's just that instead of burning things down, you are taking them out with heavy machinery. And both of these methods destroy fuel in an area so that a wildfire cannot spread there. So if you think about a wildfire that is burning through plants and spreading and spreading by burning more plants, if it suddenly hits a wall where there are no plants, it's just dirt, the wildfire is going to have nowhere to go and eventually it will fizzle out, which is the goal of these methods. So what were our conclusions? We found that controlled burns and forest thinning seem to be more helpful than harmful. Yes, they are very expensive, which is one of the cons. However, wildfires are much more expensive due to, due to the property damage and also the damage and danger to human lives. We also know that controlled burns worked well until they were made illegal, and this is because the Native Americans were doing them and they were working well to prevent large forest fires until their cultural practices were illegalized by colonizers. Lastly, we don't have any more recent proof because of long-term damage from fire suppression throughout the 1900s. So we have proof from the Native Americans, but not much in the modern time because in the 1900s, there was many, many laws that were fire suppressant laws. So as soon as a wildfire is found, it must be put out immediately. And because of that, the natural cycle of nature could not occur. So typically plants grow in the spring and then in the summer and fall, wildfires take out some of them. But because of fire suppression, they grew every year. The wild, the, the wild plants grew every year, every year, every year. And then eventually in March of 2020, there was a wildfire that could not be suppressed and it burned through all the plants all at once. And that was why it was so dangerous and so uncontrollable. So now we are enacting the correct methods, which are the fire, uh, the forest thinning and the controlled fires. But because it's been so long of doing the wrong thing, it's going to take a long time to see results of these new methods. So we have experienced some action projects that did not go as planned. So firstly, so firstly, since we were learning about how Native Americans manage wildfires, we find an amazing opportunity to participate in an event in Indian Canyon in Hollister to learn about that knowledge and fire mimicry. However, even though we had tried really hard, we have difficulty finding a way to get there. So we decided to give up these possible action projects. So after that, one of our interviewers recommended an event that fit our research topic. We could join um, prescribed burns in Belmont. However, by the time we reached out to them, the project was already done. So we had to find another action project. After that, we brainstormed an idea to document the rebuilding a fire damage park in Santa Cruz. However, after doing more research about it, we find out that a website already exists to post updates of the recovery of the park. So after three possible action projects did not work out, we were super anxious and nervous. Um, as we were already behind of this hour schedule, we were afraid that we might not have an action project until until we were able to find one, which was about forest thinning. And we were lucky enough that one of our contacts is specifically in um, 
um, reti retired battalion Fisher uh, specifically informed us about um, Chief Ari, who is in the San Bruno Fire Department. And he basically guided us and toured us about Crestmore Canyon. And these are some of the pictures that we have taken about forest thinning happening in this canyon itself. If we go to the next slide, we can see what is Crestmore Canyon. Now, Crestmore Canyon is located right next to, or basically in the surroundings of all the residential areas. So as you can see, if a wildfire would have occurred here, it would have been a disaster. Actually, Chief Ari informed us that he was actually shocked that a wildfire ha hadn't occurred there. And if it were, it would be one of the biggest devastations specifically in our county. And now you may also be wondering here about the spikes. So these spikes are specifically where workers would be setting up and specifically clearing um, a buffer zone between the canyon and the residential areas. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, the goal here was to reduce wildfire fuels where wildfires in residential areas are met. And we wanted to specifically remove problematic vegetations throughout the canyon, limiting fire access or poisoning fire risk, wood chip coverage also, and also protecting wildlife. Even though it is a canyon and we may not think that many wildlife occur there, there were. We had rat nests that even sometimes blocked the roads of the trail and you can't do anything about that. You also had specifically trees that were rotten and you would think, oh, we should take this out, but no there's already creatures living inside there. And these are some of the legislations, uh, basic limitations that sometimes even creating a forest thinning, they have to kind of limit. And lastly, is to improving creating fire access roads and trails. One thing I want to note here is um, Beta City News is specifically, we reached out to Chief Ari and for the first field trip that we did, uh, we didn't get that many uh, volunteers in our club because of time schedule. So it was only me and a friend and we got so much information about Chief Ari, but even then sometimes lack of communications and sometimes not even timing it well, we had sometimes, uh, you know, getting our second uh, field trip to only be with our team and us kind of venturing on ourselves. Now, here are some specific images before forest thinning was acted in Crestmore Canyon. And these are images uh, that we took from their own website, but also later on some images that we took. And here you can specifically see the drastic of increased grass and how if a fire would have occurred, it will migrate up to the residential areas and hit that uh, residential building. But one thing to note also there is that electric pole, something that was a flood in the construction of that residential area. So if a wildfire would have occurred, it would have been much more disaster. Now, this is what happens when we do act on forest thinning. As you can see, a lot more is cleared. So if fire would have occurred, either in the grass section, it wouldn't necessarily migrate up, or if it would occur up in the trees, jumping off to eat trees, it wouldn't because we have a buffer zone. So it's much more safer now as it is. And we also see a very little um, patch of grass. Uh, in our first field trip, uh, we saw this, but in our second, um, we didn't see that. It was fully cleared and everything. And actually um, one of the machineries here cleared it up in like two seconds. If we go to the next slide, um, here is basically some of the um, barriers that we have faced because although we only did at that instant, you know, participating, going into, you know, exploring these areas, we want to do more as, you know, P Phi Theta Kappa members, right? We want to do more than what is necessary. So we wanted to specifically volunteer. And we had so many plans about it, like, you know, joining up to a different chapter, going out and exploring and, you know, specifically volunteering for a sitting. But as you may, some of you guys may have known, uh, legislation restrictions is an issue. You know, we're not workers there, so we need to get specific uh, uh, specific consent about our school, about a specific district, and that literally just limited our action to even further. And other things were lack of communications, as I spoke previously. Um, sometimes, um, as students, um, we can't respond to emails that fast, or even sometimes uh, the people that we want to communicate. Uh, I know Chief Ari was a chief of the fire department. He had other types even duties. And sometimes we had a two week gap of not communications and that kind of made our timing really, really short and really you know, tight and time frame also. There was one instance that we were able to volunteer specifically, we got all the legislations, you know, papers and everything only for our chapter. But at the end we couldn't because our fall semester was over. 
everyone was going to vacations, everyone was leaving. And we were really devastated by this because we were so close yet not there. And lastly, um, in these even scoutings that we did specifically in Crestmore Canyon, um, sometimes we will see specifically, you know, people working, miss opportunities that we never interviewed. And then when we did, things happen like a scouting sites and incidents. Five minutes before this picture was taken, we had a multitude of people there. But then we went off to find Chief Ari. And once we found him, we got informed that one of the workers there got in a severe accident. And immediately, everything had to uh, go away. And as you can see, it looks like a desert, right? And our mission here in our second field trip was to specifically interview the workers, see specifically why they're doing this, see everything of their own purpose and their own viewpoints. And we weren't able to. Even though we weren't able to, we were still able to inform this to our groups later on in our action portions and even in our write-ups. So even if you fail in some points or you miss opportunities, always think about other ways that you can kind of spin it around. And uh, lastly, in the next slide, even if you have tribulations or things, at least in, for us in this first portion of our action, um, just have fun. That's the main thing to do, right? Um, we were a small uh, group member set at the beginning, and we all grew really close to each other. And that's the main thing you also want to get a part of this. But we also did more action portions like... Okay, um, so another one of our action projects was the San Mateo County Community College Dis District proposal of adding um, a website fire alert indicate a fire alert indicator to the websites, um, the three colleges websites, as you can see, Kenyatta College, College of San Mateo, and Skyline College. So the reason why we thought that that was important was because after reading about wildfires, after reading the eight peer review peer reviewed articles. We realized that we wanted to do something to help our community, our students, the students in our colleges, to make to make sure that they were aware of fire conditions around us, um, since our land is fire prone. And then when we researched about uh, what the, the county is currently doing to alert students about fire danger, we found out that neither nearby fires nor air quality is being uh, addressed are being addressed. Um, it only happens that the county let, lets us know about air quality conditions or fire conditions if the, the if classes get to be canceled. And we realized that so that means that it got so bad, the situation so bad that classes had to be canceled, but we realized that students have to be aware of this even before it gets to that point. Um, and then we also found out that there is an air quality indicator on another website, another uh, county website called the sustainability website. Um, but no one really know, knows how to access that. And no one really knows that that even exists. We didn't. Um, and so we thought that it was really important to have that uh, alert indicator, a fire alert indicator to show students. And on the right is, is an example of an email that Skyline College sent to us once classes were canceled because of wildfire conditions. And then our objectives for this fire alert indicator, uh, we made sure to really to have really clear, clearly designed objectives because we wanted to make a proposal for this to be added to the websites, but we didn't want to just say, oh yeah, add a fire, fire alert indicator. We made sure to really research what this would look like and what characteristics, characteristics this should have. Um, and then our goals were for it to be visible on the, uh, the county website, the SMCCD website, and on all three individual college websites. Uh, and then it should show air quality and suggested precautions, and it should alert when there are fires happening nearby. So on the right, it's just an example of something that was sent uh, to, the, to the district, to uh, something that could be added to the, the websites that would be really easy to interpret. And the way we introduced this idea was we thought, okay, so who, who can help us with this? So we realized that at the county, the district board of trustees would be the better, uh, the best idea for us because they are authorities. Basically it's a bunch of important people. And then the three colleges presidents were uh, there too in that, this meeting that we attended. Um, and we knew that 
even if they didn't uh, attend, they didn't uh, accept our proposal, they would at least hear us and understand why this idea is important. And so we went to a board meeting uh, and we made a public comment during the public comment section. And aside from the public comment, we also uh, wrote an email with the reasons why we think this is important and with objectives and how what this um, what this indicator would look like. So we provide examples of fire alerts indicator. And then we emphasize that having this uh, indicator on the websites would provide equal access to information for people of all backgrounds, because some people who are immigrants or international students, I'm an immigrant. Um, I didn't know that California was fire prone, so I was really shocked finding out about this during this research. So we think that it's important to have this indicator on the website in case there are students who are not familiar with that. And then some barriers that we faced during that project basically were mostly related to finding the calendar of board meetings because it seems like sometimes, um, it, it seemed like it was really difficult to access. We didn't know exactly who to ask, who to email. And then eventually we were able to get someone's contact and the person let us know. And then they let us know that we would only have one specific moment to speak during the meeting, which was the public comment section. And that was, that was going to be really short and it was difficult to understand. We're not familiar with that type of process. And we noticed that the meetings were really rushed um, and we were afraid that we would miss our window to speak. So we were really terrified. Uh, also, the meeting was hybrid, so we, we experienced some technology issues because when we talked, uh, we were on Zoom, we weren't sure if they could hear us from there, if they could see us. Um, so these were some problems that we faced, but in the end, we were really happy about how we were able to make a proposal about something that could help our students. So as you can see, those were our first two action projects. and. Yes, we were able to complete the two action projects. However, if you think about it, both of them were suggesting and observing. We felt that there wasn't enough concrete action in our action, action portion yet. So what we did is that we brainstormed ideas and we went to last year or the year before that, the year before that, other Beta Zeta New projects, HIA projects, and we saw what they had done. They interviewed guest speakers, they did social media promotion to raise awareness, and we thought, well, maybe we can try something like that to strengthen our action portion. And then we were presented with this very interesting opportunity. A business professor contacted one of our advisors and asked if we could give a presentation to his business class to talk about our project. And he ended up inviting a whole bunch of other business classes. So we were able to reach quite a few people with a presentation similar to this one. And that spawned a new idea. And we gave a similar presentation to another student program. And this one was a bit of a much bigger student program. So it attracted a wide variety of students from our college, from the neighboring community colleges that Annie talked about, and also even some alumni and people who were not students at all. So these are some of the flyers that we showed to uh, invite people to the two workshops. And also here's a screenshot in the center of us doing one of the workshops. Basically we talked about um, the research portion, the action portion, and also about what it's like to join Phi Theta Kappa and the responsibilities that we have and the benefits to try and encourage some people to join as well. Okay, and then in terms of how we approached the write-up of this research, um, I would say that this was the most challenging part for us because um, we were new members, we were new officers, so we didn't know exactly what to do. So the first thing that we did was looking at the rubric, the, the Hallmark rubric, and, uh, and pasting the entire rubric onto a document, a Google document. And we also made sure to look at the, only the marks for the full grade, because we didn't want to go for a half grade or low grade, we wanted full grade. Um, so we pasted everything onto a document, and then we um, started from there. Um, and then we made sure also to verify that our research conclusions matched the theme that we picked for our research and our research question. Because sometimes I feel like it's easy to start with a topic and then kind of go off topic after uh, we just get carried away uh, because we think that one thing relates to the other, but we had to make sure that our research question was being answered and that the research question was also related to the theme. So it was really important for us to make, to create a really cohesive uh, project um, and that, like I said, also responding to uh, attending, um, meeting the criteria in the rubric. Um, and then after we had both the rubric, the, the research question, and also the theme for our project on one document, the VP of scholarship, me, 
Uh, I wrote the, the rough draft and the, uh, my officer team revised my peers. Um, okay, can you go to the next slide, please? Next slide, oh, thank you. Um, so some problems that we experienced when writing the Hallmark, um, like I said, I was writing the, full, the, the, the rough draft and it was a little difficult to do that during winter break. Uh, because we were done with classes, but we still had this to do, and we needed to make sure that we still had the motivation to uh, include as much about our research as we could. Uh, and doing that during winter break wasn't the best thing for us. So in next time, we, we're definitely going to plan better uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Um, and then also, uh, we had to have various meetings to address many topics, because sometimes we didn't know exactly how to um, how to answer a question, which parts of the research we wanted to include. Um, and then when deciding about how to answer the questions, we had a lot of conflicting feedback. Um, and all of that was really complicated because I was in Brazil, my home country at that time. And uh, at the same time that I was writing the, the rough draft, I also had to make sure that I was uh, attending the meetings and everyone was having meetings during winter break. And then there was, I was in a different time zone, uh, but we made sure I was motivated enough uh, to do this for myself and for my peers that it made me uh, continue writing the rough draft. And then after they helped me uh, and they, they they all looked at the, the the draft and the advisors helped us a lot too with the comments that they made. Uh, we were able to write a really good uh, Hallmark um, entry. So in conclusion, there are a few things that we have learned during the HIA project and what we want to share them with you. Next slide, please. So firstly, timeline is really important. As I was talking about before, because we spend more time on topic selection than we thought, also our three possible action projects did not work out as planned. We were really behind our schedule and we had to finish our homework entry over the winter break, which is really challenging as Annie said. So I would suggest that plan a timeline before your chapter starts on HIA and stick to it along your way to make sure that your project can be done can be done timely. Secondly, keep in mind that things could happen. In our cases, the first three planned action projects did not work out. Luckily, we were able to find other actions to do for the HIA. So it is always a good idea to have backup action projects just in case. And lastly, um, is how to, and when to split up the task. During most of the time among the process, we split the work between members. However, there was also things that we did not split the work for. As Annie just said, she was the only one who wrote the first draft for our homework entry. We chose to do this because having the same person write the whole entry could make it consistent. After the rough draft, every member and advisor looked through it and provided feedback and revised it just to make sure that we didn't miss anything and everyone's opinion was considered. Um, so that's all of the things that we have learned. I hope it will be helpful to you and thank you so much for your attention. All right, I also wanted to open it up for questions just because during the during the presentation, I saw my chat blowing up and I tried to read all of them, but I wasn't, it's a little hard to read it when you're sharing the screen. Well done, great presentation. I actually had one quick question. I was curious, what was the hardest part, most challenging part for you guys? Um, personally, for me, the challenging part is working and trying to contact specifically sometimes outside, uh, you know, organizations and all that, because there's multiple schedules that you all have to kind of balance out and, you know, always try to be realistic also about them. So personally, for me, that was one of the most challenging part about it, um, trying to make that happen, right? And make try to make a contact first meeting happen. So do we have any other questions out there? If not, I really want to uh, 
thank the awesome team of Beta Zeta Nu chapter from Kenyatta College. This was an outstanding example of an honors in action project. Um, it's always good to have some sort of model so that you have a goal, but it's nice to see what others have done. And as you heard from our presenters, they went back to what other um, officer teams had done in the past to learn from them as well. So that's what I really call collaboration <laughs> and leaving a legacy, just as we talked about earlier in our presentation. Uh, you're not just doing this for yourself and your chapter, you're doing it to leave a legacy of learning and historical significance um, with your chapters. And um, we certainly have a great uh, theme to work with, the art and science of play. I, I can hardly wait to jump into it myself. And I wanna thank all of the team officers for their wonderful entry and congratulations to all of you. Uh, Well-deserved uh, rewards of your efforts. And um, thank you for a wonderful presentation today. I'm going to turn the mic back over to Christine Lowe. Um, Madam President, back to you. Great, thank you, Barbara. And thank you so much, Beta Zeta Nu. This is uh, such an amazing project. And as you saw with the chat blowing up, um, sometimes these are very difficult and challenging decisions and actions. And so, you know, sometimes the, there could be some controversy involved. Sometimes it could just provoke a lot of thought. And so that's what Honors in Action projects are intended to do, not only enrich the skills that you are developing um, as a researcher, as a collaborator, but also being able to take on some of the tougher questions. So. Uh, congratulations again to Beta Zeta Nu. I know that the experiences that you gleaned is going to take you at levels that you probably never even imagined. So well done, and I look forward to staying in touch with you. All right, so we are on to some fun stuff here. Uh, we've got a raffle. Uh, so we, uh, <laughs> a little behind the scenes uh, story here. So. Uh, we had a, a meeting with our alumni association to determine, um, you know, a prize uh, for for attending our honors in action boot camp. And so, um, not only is there going to be one prize or two, there's five. So it's really awesome, and it's going to be based on a prize that is given per district. Uh, so if you are in a Northwest district, you get a prize. I feel like Oprah, you get a prize, you get a prize, you get a prize. Um, so each district will have a prize winner. Um, so we will go ahead and start off with the Southeastern district. And there were 10 chapters who were represented uh, in our Southeast district. Now, I know there's a high tech way to do this, but I'll tell you, I was staring at the screen all week. I just couldn't do one more thing. So I'm gonna do a little old school here. So this is a thing called a box and we have little tickets here. <laughs> so each one has been folded and it's an empty box. There's nothing here. So I take it that you will trust my honesty and put this in, I've got my eyes closed. All right. It gives me an activity to do because when you're sitting on a laptop, you need to be active. So here we go, and I'm playing, right? All right, so from the Southeast District, the winner is, and I'll tell you what the prize is, Norco College. Is there anyone from Norco College here? No. Okay, try it again. Southwestern College. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> okay. Yay. So your chapter will select one individual, and you don't know what the price is. Drum roll. It is a free registration to the Fall Leadership Conference. So, all right. We got a winner. Okay. So, the next district. Ah, I'm not skipping the one. All right, let's do uh, my home district on Northwest District. Okay, so again. Yeah. 
definitely cheer. All right. So I've got the number, got the whole jet tickets in there. Taking it up. Look at those endorphins running. Yeah. All right. Napa Valley College. Anyone from Napa Valley College? Nope. Going once. Something else oh. here. Oh, there is. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Where? So yes. So your chapter will select one representative to attend the Fall Leadership Conference for free. Thank you. All right. So we've got. Let's do the Southwest District. Anyone from Southwest District here? Want to hear you? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> okay. All right. Sometimes old school is the best. And the winner is Taft College. Anyone from Taft College? I didn't anyone? see anyone. All right. Did we get somebody in a lucky winner? Santa Ana College. Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So your chapter has one representative who will attend the Fall Leadership Conference. Three. Now, is there anyone from the Nevada district? Uh, we've got. We are here. We are here. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. What if you don't know what district you're in? <laughs> Then you go to our regional website. <laughs> okay. I'll Thank put you. it in the chat. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. There's one that got snagged. Sorry. <clears throat> College of Southern Nevada. Woo, we're here. All right. So free registration to the Fall Leadership Conference. And finally, well, actually there isn't a finally, because uh, there's a surprise even to the alumni, uh, Northeast District. So wow. second to last. Okay, this is fun. Doing this at one in the morning. Okay, shaking up the box, shaking the box. Uh, all right, Sacramento City College, I know you're in town today, <laughs> you're in the house, all right, so your chapter will select one individual to attend the Fall Leadership Conference for free, awesome, so Christine, I have a surprise, Christine, for... may I ask a question? Oh, yes, Miriam. So when you say for free, do you mean just the registration ticket? Yes, just the registration. I'm so, just yes, checking. very important you bring that up. So you still have to take care of your accommodations and transportation, um, but it's so worth it because you're going to learn so much at the Fall Leadership Conference. Number of soft skills that the regional <coughs> officer teams will be uh, describing to you, the alumni, and also just a wonderful way to interact with everyone. And and folks who are here at boot camp, you get to see them in person. So. It's worth the effort. So definitely free registration, but you definitely have to take care of your accommodations and transportation. So we have a surprise. Uh, for those who are attending from the Pacific region, we have a nice surprise for you. There has been an anonymous donor uh, for all your effort, getting up early and, and being a part of our regions. Uh, I know not everyone would be willing to chime in to another region's event, but we're so grateful that you are that there is an anonymous donor who will be uh, contributing two $50 gift cards from Amazon. So I have a drawing for you. This is going in the box as well. And the winning chapter, regardless of their attendance, will receive that gift card. Oh, this is so cool. So the first one is from the College of Micronesia. Hey! <laughs> oh, fantastic! Hey. That is so Yay, great. Cindy! Fantastic! Yes. So, 
the location and where you're out is just fascinating. And uh, I'm so glad you're here. Congratulations. Thank you. Yay. All right. And the final winner is from the Waipahu High School Early College. All right. So they're going to get a prize as well. So thank you all so much for indulging me and in going a little old school here. This was the way to go after staring at a, a laptop screen. And I've learned from Barbara Demopoulos and Michael Miller, don't get Zoom fatigue. Do something else that makes it fun and engaging. So thank you so much for indulging me. So I will go ahead and, and stare at the screen again and go ahead and wrap up this uh, presentation here. Go ahead and share the screen. I'm gonna skip this a little bit. We had a raffle. All right, so we have some upcoming events. Um, we do have an Honors Institute and I will go ahead and have Susan chime in a little bit because there's some, some really significant but special changes for this year's Honors Institute. Susan, is it gonna cost us anything this year? It is not. Um, Honors Institute is not going to be at a specific time. What we're doing is um, we are, uh, recording some renowned speakers and their presentations, and we're going to allow regions to use those and, and chapters to use them as well, but um, to use them for your programming so the California Nevada region can um, pick amongst the, the speakers you'd like to use throughout the year. Um, we're excited about that and then uh, look for some opportunities. We are going to still have faculty scholars and a faculty scholar conference. We are going to um, have that faculty scholar conference to train faculty scholars um, uh, just or talk about the honor study topic as well as honors in action so that they can go back to regions and, and then talk in, uh, to people about honors in action and the, and the topic and um, help train other people. Fantastic. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Going to the Honors Institute, whether it was virtual or in person, was the most satisfying thing that I enjoyed uh, as, in, as part of the Honors in Action process. So I'm so glad that this is going to be a virtual event and for free. This is awesome. I love this stuff. So um, actually, since I still have you uh, online here, uh, tell us a little bit about the Honors in Action grant deadline. Yes, we're going to have um, fall 2022 Honors in Action grants. Look for the application to go up probably in August. Um, it may be in July. And then the grant applications will be due in September. So you can take a, a look at the application and see if you want to start your Honors in Action project. Think about where you might need some funds. It can be for the research part, the action, um, for collaborators. There are lots of things you can do with that. So take a look at uh, ptk.org backslash honors and um, think about it. We would like to help fund your project to help you enhance your project. So think about that. The application due um, in September and we'll have a very specific date soon. Great. Well, thank you so much, Susan, for those updates. And uh, I'm also going to share some really great news. So if you enjoyed Honors in Action Bootcamp, we've got another workshop for you. So in a few weeks on June 18th, we have the, Nevada, we have the college project workshop that is uh, presented by the Nevada California region. And so I know Miriam has been managing the floor here, but can you share a little bit of our special guests? So we have three special guests. Oh. We have from headquarters, Jennifer Stanford, and we have two of our Hallmark award-winning college project chapters. We have Great Basin College, who is in uh, Elko, Nevada, and then we have Saddleback College from our own Southwest District. All right. Saddleback. <laughs> well, that is awesome. I'm so glad that uh, they're going to be uh, presenting their respective award-winning projects, and uh, I'm excited to, to attend that. So, uh, we have another special event. This is something that uh, our Alumni Association has never done before. We are going to share, uh, have a presentation all about Phi Theta Kappa and Espanol. So I speak Spanish poorly, and so I've been studying this for the past several months here, but not to worry. Uh, we have Bruno Rhodes, 
uh, who is our associate regional coordinator, uh, who is uh, who speaks Spanish fluently, and also two of our former regional officers, Enrique Berenda and um, oh my gosh, Karina Sanchez. Uh, and so they will be co-presenting this presentation. I'm gonna be Miriam that day in which I'll be the floor manager, but I am so excited to brush up on my Spanish. Uh, shame on me for not keeping this up in high school, but um, I'm so excited to, to share with our Spanish speaking students all about Phi Theta Kappa. So that will take place sometime in September. And then once Enrique and Karina are accepted in the colleges of hopefully their first choice, then we'll figure out what their school schedule is like so that then we can go ahead and schedule and it won't be a, a conflict for them. Uh, and of course we have our one of our exciting uh, conference uh, events of the year and that is the full leadership conference. And that'll be held on Friday and Saturday, the 21st and 22nd of October. And it's gonna be in my hometown of LA, woohoo! So it's just south of the LAX airport. It's a wonderful um, hotel location. And again, everything that you learned here about honors in action, you're gonna learn so much more with the number of soft skills that you can get as part of being a Phi Theta Kappa. And so um, that is also will be up on the regional website and I'll give you all this information a few days after our boot camp. And then Faustina Washburn, our executive vice president is hosting a work it workshop. So work it, work it for those who are transferring or actually are not planning to transfer um, or want to improve their chances on getting um, a good first job or a good career of their first choice. We've got this workshop for you. So Faustina has been working really hard to getting this uh, all set up. And that's going to be uh, right after the Fall Leadership Conference, so probably right after um, or in November. And then I know I'm part of my screen's in the way here. And then finally, TIA 3, that's coming back. And so we're going to have a fresh start. Uh, and so I'll be organizing that and I'll look for some guest speakers to get a fresh start to, to 2023. So there's a lot of great events to help you in your FICA to Kappa journeys. I want to once again thank Susan Edwards. Uh, gosh, what an amazing presentation. I'm always, always learning something new about honors in action. Thank you for embracing our Nevada, California region and also letting me get to know you a little bit more over the last few years. I've known you since I was a regional officer, but gosh, I'm so glad. And even though you're a Houston Astros fan, I still love you. So. <laughs> <laughs> and um, to my Giants fans, friends from the Beta State and New Chapter, because I live in Giants territory, um, thank you so much. Uh, you have you provided a great presentation, and uh, I'm so excited for those who are transferring and for those, and especially Anthony, who is a regional officer, I'm so excited to work with you. And thank you to the advisors, Patty Hall, Paul Rosselli and Autumn McMahon for really just letting them grow and steer them in the right direction and being so generous with your time and energy to make this project so successful and rewarding for the chapter officers. So thank you once again. Um, some additional thanks here is uh, our, again, our distinguished regional uh, VIP guests. And of course, <clears throat> General Miriam Moody, our regional coordinator for my Nevada, California region, and uh, General Aaron Millard, regional coordinator of Pacific region. It's, it was so great to meet you at Catalyst. And thank you for the Pacific region chapters. It means so much to me personally that you took time out of your early Saturday morning to be here with us. I also wanna thank Patty Ben Adder and Ryan Martin, who are our chapter development and outreach coordinators. Um, they were, they, provided a wonderful presentation for um, the second presentation. And so with Susan's permission, I was able to use quite a, those, a number of those slides and also try to reflect the pulse of our Nevada, California region and share a former a student's uh, perspective and how the Alumni Association can help. So thank you again, Patty and Ryan. I also wanna thank our regional officer team uh, for getting the word out, using the social media platforms to get Honors in Action Bootcamp out. And of course, our, oh, I'm so happy to say this, our award-winning Nevada California Regional Alumni Association teammates. This could not be done without you and your energy. And thank you for believing in me as your leader and, um, and for playing around uh, in this Honors in Action Bootcamp. So without further ado, congratulations and thank you. You have graduated from Honors in Action Bootcamp Congratulations, good luck in your projects, and we are here for you. So I'll give you all your contact information. 
um, a few days after, give me some time to rest and not look at the screen for so long, but you'll get all the slides and presentations and contact information in case you have any questions. Take care, everyone, and I wish you all a good afternoon. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. It's a pleasure meeting you all. Have a great